Hello folks. In this video, we're going to talk about the combination of resistance and reactance or impedance, right? So we say that an impedance is the general term. So impedance Z is some combination of resistance R and some reactance. All right, so that would be x, j, plus or minus j, x. Okay. Just to keep this complete, we also say that uh, the, the admittance y is equal to 1 over z. Okay, that's called the admittance. Uh, we already know that uh, g is equal to 1 over r, conductance, and also b, the susceptance, is 1 over x. Okay, so we can draw a little graph over here, and what we would have on the real axis would be the r, and then this is our imaginary, so this is plus j up here, this is where the x sub l would be, this is minus j down here, which is where the x sub c would be. In the last video we noted that x sub l is equal to j 2 pi fl and x sub c is equal to minus j 1 over 2 pi fc, right? So x sub l increases with frequency, right? We could put a real quick thing down here. So the magnitude of x sub l goes like this and the magnitude of x sub c goes like that, right? goes towards zero. Okay, so let's consider uh, what we would have if we, you know, had some components in series in parallel and so forth. So let's say we have a resistor and an inductor. We'll start with that. We'll say we have a 500 ohm resistor and the inductance is 100 millihenries. So the first thing I want to do here is figure out a value for my x sub l given my frequency. All right, so let's say that f, because this will clearly depend on the value of the frequency, right? So let's just say f um, is equal to 1 kilohertz. Now we're doing this at single frequency sine waves. There's an interesting thing that happens that I'll explain toward the end. But just remember, we're talking about single frequency sine wave. It's not going to change frequency, it's not shifting, it's not a complex wave that has multiple sine waves in it, it's just a simple sine wave. Okay, so this is going to be driven, there's a current going through here that's uh, 1 kilohertz. Now it doesn't matter what the amplitude is, right? just like it doesn't matter if it's 1 volt or 10 volts, it's a 500 ohm resistor. Right? Same thing is true with this inductor. Right? Okay, so the x sub l is going to be j2 pi fl. So f over here is 1k and l is 100 millihenries. All right, so those k's and millis are going to cancel. That's 100 times 2 pi, which is going to be j 628 ohms. Some people say it's 628 j ohms. I always like to put the j in front so it doesn't get sort of mushed into my unit. All right, so we could say in a uh, like a rectangular form, if you will, I'm going to use my little thing over here, um, we could say that this is, because it's in series, just the addition of these two pieces. So here's my 500, right? And then we have the x sub l at 628, so that's maybe you know, like that. So the combination is this impedance Z, right? That's Z. So you could say Z, you could just put it directly in rectangular form. You can say it's 500 plus J628, and you're done in ohms. Whatever you do, don't add them together simply like they're scalars. It's not 1128 ohms. 
No, 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 no. Not what it is. This is what you do. Reels to reels, imaginaries to imaginaries. Okay. So this is what we wind up with. Now, um, I would perhaps like to know what this is in, in uh, polar form. Okay. And we looked at that in a preceding video, right? To get the magnitude, we can just use a high, um, Pythagorean theorem. So take the square root of 500 squared plus 628 squared, right? And that result will get you 803 ohms. And then to get the angle, right, theta, is simply the arctan of x over r, right, opposite over adjacent. So um, that will work out too. Let's see, what's my x? 628 over 500. Now, just looking at that, without even putting that in your calculator, you can see that's going to be a little bit more than 45 degrees, right? If it was 500, 500, it'd be exactly 45. So it's going to be a little bit more than that, right? In fact, um, it turns out to be 51.5 degrees. So Z, you can either say Z is 500 plus J628, or you can say it's 803 at an angle of 51.5. And sometimes it's handy to have it in one form versus the other. Those are equivalent things. Okay. What if this was uh, a capacitor? Well, the only real difference is this guy would be going down, right, rather than up. So you're going to get a, a vector out here in the fourth quadrant rather than the first quadrant. So your theta value is going to be negative. We wouldn't go all the way around, and we wouldn't have, you know, an angle of, uh, you know, 312 degrees or something like that we would always sort of collapse it between. So if it's between 0 and 90, then we know it's inductive. If it's between 0 and minus 90, then we know it's capacitive, net. Because after all, I could also have a capacitor in series here, right? In which case there would be, so if I had three of these, right? I might have a little, a little capacitance down here. So this would get combined with this. Like if this was uh, minus J100, let's say, so I would just do a little combo there, knock off the 100, meaning I only have 528 over here. And that would make this a little bit shorter and shallower. Okay. Reels to reels, imaginaries to imaginaries. Well, what if we have something that's uh, in parallel? How do I combine this up? Well, let's use the same values since we've already computed a few things. When we um, look at this, we can still use product sum rule on this. We've already figured out the value of x sub l. So just to be really persnickety about it, all right, that's 500, and this is j. 628, right? So what is that? Well, I can, like I said, I can use product sum rule. I could use um, the reciprocal rule. But, you know, I've just has two of them, so product sum rule would work out really well here. So the equivalent um, impedance of this product would be r times j x sub l divided by r plus j x sub l. All right, so I've got 500 in angle of zero which is my resistor, times the x sub l. All right, now I'm going to put these in polar form, because remember, when we multiply, it's convenient to have in polar form. So if you have a nice calculator, it won't make any difference. You can just put it in either way. But anyway, just to be consistent about it. And then I already know what r plus j um, x sub l is. Um, that's 500 plus j628. Okay, But because we're going to divide... It would probably be more convenient to have it in this form, the 803, All right? But I'm going to I'm going to do both. So 
So when you work this out, right, 500 times the uh, 628, that's basically half a K. So you're going to get 314 K at uh, an angle of 90. And that's going to be divided by this 803 at an angle of 51 and a half. Okay. And that works out to 391 at an angle of 38.5 degrees. All right, so that's the equivalent. Now here's the cool thing. I can take this and turn this back into a rectangular form. So the R of this would be the magnitude of Z times cosine theta. In other words, 391 times the cosine of 38.5 degrees. And that is going to give us 306. And the x value right, is going to be uh, z times the sine of theta. And because this is positive, I know this is going to be inductive. But if you want to, you can say that's jx, jz, blah, 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 blah. Um, but the you know, the, 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 the sign will work out. The sign is in the plus minus, not as in this guy. Um, it'll work out. So anyway, that's 391 times the sine of 38.5 degrees. And that will give us J243. In other words, the other way of writing this, just like I did over here, the other way of writing this in rectangular form is to say it's 306 plus J243. If you think about that, I could visualize that as a resistor of 306 ohms and an inductor that's equal to J243. Now, I know the frequency, so I could actually use my equation here backwards to determine what the effective value of inductance is. Right? Clearly, it's not going to be 100 millihenries. You know, it's going to be somewhere in the, without a calculator, somewhere in the, like the 40 millihenry range or whatever. Um, so this series combination, this is really kind of cool to think about, this series combination is equivalent to this parallel combination. We find this to be useful in certain analysis techniques that we use in the future. Just something to, good to keep kind of, kind of in the back of your mind, all right? Okay, um, that is an equivalent at one frequency. It's not an absolute. Like I said, you could figure out what you know what this um, exabel turns into as a as an inductance value. That doesn't mean that across the board it's going to work at any frequency, because what ends up happening is you know if we come back here and we say, oh no, I'm going to change the frequency from one kilohertz to uh, you know five kilohertz or 65 kilohertz or whatever the heck it is, you know, this X of L is going to change. And of course, the you know, resulting vector that we're going to draw out here is going to change. The components change. In other words, the, the J243 over here, the X of L, changes in the equivalent circuit. So that really only works at one frequency. Okay. All right. Now that we know how to combine these things, always, always, always vector combinations, right? Um, you know, if I see anybody add these two together and say, oh, the result of this is um, 549, I'm going to come to your house and, you know, just belittle you in front of all your friends and family, okay? No, 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 okay? They have to be separate. All right. Well, I wouldn't really do that. Come on. You really think I'm going to come to your house and belittle you? No, I'm not going to do that. That's just too much work. <laughs> okay. We'll pick this up next time. We're going to start looking at uh, series circuits. See how KVL and Ohm's Law can roll into this. All righty. Remember, single frequency sine wave. That's what this is. Hey, you know, 
before we go, let me let me kind of get your brain working here for a sec. I've mentioned this before. What if we had a funky waveform coming in here, right? Like, um, you know, music, voice, whatever. I got some weird looking waveform coming in here. Well, we already know this can this contains many many sine waves, right? So what's the XL value for something like this or something like this? You know, maybe this contains a one kilohertz sign and a 40 kilohertz sign and a you know 75 hertz sign, you know, just to throw some numbers out. How do you figure this out? Well, it turns out the inductor is all of those things simultaneously. So if I have a waveform, you know, just to keep it simple, right? If I have a waveform that combined um, a one kilohertz sine wave and a three kilohertz sine wave, okay, then at, you know, at, at the first frequency, let's say it works out to 100 ohms. At the second frequency, maybe it works out to 300 ohms. It's both of those things at the same time. In other words, it looks like 100 ohms to the one kilohertz component, and it looks like 300 ohms to the 3 kilohertz component. That's really kind of interesting. It's a very powerful concept. It allows us to do things like make filters, right? It's really, really important. But again, this analysis here is uh, strictly single frequency sine waves, okay? But ultimately, this is the kind of stuff we want to deal with, all right? Okay, okay. <laughs>